can read this. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Kevin Bischoff with Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield of Utah. And on behalf of Regents and our partners, Utah State University and President Stan Ulbricht, it is my pleasure to welcome you to another sunrise session. Regents is pleased to be entering our fifth year as a sponsor of this. Boy, that seems to have gone fast. But uh, the, these uh, uh, sessions are designed, are very valuable sessions, designed to educate leaders on essential issues influencing Utah's future. Each sunrise session, and I've been to almost every one of them, deals with fascinating issues, and that's why Regents values these sessions and supports with our time and our resources these types of gatherings. I want to emphasize what an important partner Utah State has been for us at Regents. These sunrise sessions are an effective way for both of our organizations to showcase the incredible work that is being done at Utah State and to show how proud we are to be associated with the university. Now it is my honor this morning to be able to introduce President Stan Albrick. Stan Ulbrich is the 15th president of Utah State University. He previously served four years as executive vice president and provost. He was appointed president in February of 2005. President Ulbrich's accomplishments uh, at Utah State are too numerous to mention here, but each of you are aware of the huge impact that Utah State has on the entire state of Utah, and it seems to me as though that impact has grown exponentially under President Ulbrich's leadership. So if you would, please join me in a warm welcome for President Stan Ulbricht. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin, and uh, special thanks again to Regents. As uh, Kevin indicates, uh, time goes by so quickly. I think this is the 15th of these that we have done, and it's always good to look around the room and see Don and others, I think, have been to probably all of them, Don, haven't you? Some of you have been very faithful attenders. We've appreciated that very much. It's, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to create increased exposure for what we think is outstanding work that's being done at Utah State University. And we've appreciated the support of those of you who are along the West Edge front who have been willing to come out on these early morning breakfast events and learn more about some of the things that we're doing at Utah State. We're very proud of the work of our faculty. We've been able to introduce you to a very broad range of I think interesting and exciting topics, uh, each one a little bit different. And we've tried over the course of these 15 different events to really highlight different aspects of the university and different parts of, of the research program that goes on at our, at our institution. If there are sunrise sessions that you may have missed or sunrise sessions that you, you remember and say, gosh, I wish I would have taken some notes or, or obtained copies of the slides, all you have to do is go to our website, research.usu.edu, and uh, go to the web page, and you will be able to look back at any of the previous 14 Sunrise Sessions that have been held. Today, again, we, we introduce another area of the university. The uh, presentation comes from the discipline of archaeology. Dr. Bonnie Pitblato's presentation will focus on the earliest inhabitants of northern Utah and southeastern Idaho going back a long, long time. Uh, some really may not expect cutting edge research and even commercialization to be coming from, as she says, really old dirt. But we're going to hear about the distant past, distant past. And we'll also talk about some of the opportunities that this is creating for our students as well as for our research faculty. And, and again, much of the focus of the Sunrise Sessions has been on commercialization opportunities, technology commercialization. And I think Bonnie will talk a little bit about uh, a very successful effort that is occurring in that part of our institution. Let me just quickly introduce Dr. Bonnie Pitblato to you. She received her bachelor's in Phi Beta Cap honors at Carleton College in 1990 and her master's and PhD in archeology span from the University of Arizona in 1999. She specializes in the early human occupants of the Rocky Mountain region She's published numerous articles on this topic and two books. She is an associate professor of archaeology in the Department of Sociology, Social Work, and Anthropology, is director of anthropology program in the USU Museum of Anthropology, and among her mother, many other accomplishments, a, a, a great researcher, a great teacher, 
but she's also the 2009 College of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences Undergraduate Mentor of the Year, and so much of the focus has been on our undergraduate students. She currently holds grants from the National Science Foundation and the Bureau of Land Management, and Bonnie, now we'll look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you, President Albrecht. Thank you, Regents, for this opportunity. And thank all of you who are willing to come out at 7.30 in the morning for this talk on archaeology. I will try to make it interesting and keep you awake. All right. So we're going to be focusing, indeed, on my research here close to home in northern Utah and southeastern Idaho. And the name of my talk there emphasizes the real 10,000 BC, because one of the messages I want to get across is that we're not, and you all know this, but it doesn't hurt to say it, that we're not exactly what's portrayed in the Hollywood movies. We're not quite Indiana Jones, although I almost got hit by a boulder this summer, so I felt a little bit Indiana Jonesy. We're not Laura Croft Tomb Raider, and we're definitely not 10,000 BC the movie. Did anybody have the distinct? Uh, okay, so we've had a few that have seen the movie. So, not, and, and this one is particularly rankling to me because this is the time frame that I focus on, 10,000 BC. I can forgive Indy. He's working in a different period, different place. This is my territory here, so I don't like people encroaching on that. So let's we'll start off. I'm going to show you a little clip from the movie, and let's see how awake you are and how many anachronisms and potential problems you guys can pick out in about 10 seconds of movie, and it'll get your heart pumping. Ready? That's one. <laughs> Not a god! Does that not make you want to be an archaeologist? That is awesome. However, there are a few problems that you probably picked up on. The mammoths, they can stay at 10,000 BC. They're welcome in the picture. The people are welcome, maybe not quite in those densities. Probably a little lower density of people on the landscape. What were some of the things that maybe didn't belong so much? The really white teeth. All right, very good. They may have had some medicinal tooth whitener back then. I don't know. How about those, those domesticated mammoths pulling the cart? I don't want to be the guy that's out there domesticating mammoths. Not probably a very good idea. Pyramids, not so much. Pyramids, very, very late in the sequence, way later than 10,000 BC. And did you catch the Utah Velociraptor? or whatever that thing was, that's many, many millions of years too early. This is what Hollywood does to us. And so we have to start in the classroom with our students in defining what it really is. Okay, so the mammoths stay, the people stay, the rest of that stuff, not so great. Okay, so what I would like to do today, in addition to kind of giving you a sense of what archeologists really do, is begin by setting the stage and talk just a little bit about what I've been doing for the past 15 or so years. Then I'll move into the archaeological foundation that we have to build on in this new project area in northern Utah and southeastern Idaho. And you're going to have to pay really close attention because that part of the talk goes about that fast because there is no foundation to build on. Okay. I'll talk about what we do when we have to start an archaeological research program from scratch, when we just don't have the shoulders of giants to build on as we normally do in, in academia. I'll talk about what we've learned so far in about three years of work now, so we're just getting into this. And I'll talk about what we foresee happening in the next 15 years, or maybe I'll get lucky and get 30 out there. And most importantly at the end, why we should care. And I submit to you now, and will submit to you at the end of my talk, that there are reasons beyond the box office fun that Hollywood gives us that we should care about archaeology. So for the last 15 or so years, this is me up on top of a mountain this summer at about 13,000 feet. I focused on what people were doing in the southern Rocky Mountains. When I began this work, the perception largely, not exclusively, but largely, was that mountains were an impediment. They weren't a place that people would, of any period, would spend a lot of time. That didn't make any sense to me. 
I loved climbing mountains. I loved being in the mountains. I loved living in the mountains. We all live in the mountains. So that never sat well. So I set out to try to figure out what was really going on up there. And ultimately, I determined that, in fact, we just haven't been looking hard enough. And there's lots of evidence of occupation. It's early. As soon as people make it to North America, and as soon as the mountains are deglaciated at the end of the Ice Age, people are up there. They're using them. They're using them intensively. And they never leave. So I published that work and my thinking on how specifically people would have used that mountain landscape in a book in 2003, this one here, called Paleo-Indian Occupation of the Southern Rocky Mountains. And we'll define Paleo-Indian in a minute, but suffice it to say we're talking really early people in North America. And then a couple of years ago, I published a, an edited volume. And this edited volume really, I think, reflects a paradigm shift that we've undergone since I began my work. Now, in Colorado at least, nobody's working in any place but the mountains. The plains, which make up a good chunk of the state, are not the focus of work that they were for over 100 years in terms of Paleo-Indian archaeology. All the action's up in the mountains. So very, very interesting place to be working. OK, so a little orientation as to the time frame that I study and that will be the focus of our talk today. And just to put it into the broader context of North American archaeology, we have a pretty good sense now that people are in the Americas by 15 to 16,000 years ago. This is a hot point of contention, but my reading of the evidence puts the people there that early. By 11,600 or so years ago, people are everywhere throughout the Americas. That's the early time frame for the Clovis culture. If you've heard any term associated with early archaeology, you've heard the term Clovis. Clovis are the first sustained occupants of North America and parts of Central America. They make very distinctive spear points. We'll see pictures of some in a bit. And they really they serve as the beginning point for what we refer to as the Paleo-Indian era. Okay, the Paleo-Indian era I define as the period of time that humans coexist with megafauna. Early on in the Ice Age, mammoths like we saw in our movie clip, a little bit later, giant forms of bison. Okay, but during that time frame, and that's what we're going to be focusing on today, we have people here with these magnificent creatures who I'd love to see. Never will. After that, for 8,000 to about 1,000 years, we have people all over the Americas hunting and gathering. We have corn agriculture coming into the picture and group with groups like the Fremont and ancestral Puebloans by at least 200 BC or so. And by about AD 1300, we have evidence for tribes that we're familiar with, the Ute, the Shoshone, the Navajo, the Paiute, and many, many, many others. So that gives you a little framework for what we're doing here today and what my work entails. This new research focal area of mine includes two counties in Utah, Cache and Rich County down here, and all are parts of six counties in southeastern Idaho that you see identified here. So Franklin, Bear Lake, Bannock, parts of Bonneville, parts of Bingham. And most of my work so far has been focused on the Idaho side of the border. This is going to change this coming summer. We're going to give Cash and Rich a lot of research love. So we're going to have a lot of new information soon on them. But when I talk about results so far, I'll be focusing on the southeastern Idaho part of this picture. Now, I promised that I would talk about the foundation that I have to build on. So here we're looking at our, our area of interest. And again, you pay attention, this is going to go fast. We have one site out here called Hogup Cave, which is to the west of us in Box Elder County. It's great. It's a well-excavated, well-documented site, but it's rather late. It just barely overlaps my time frame of interest. It's also in the Great Basin proper, which this area is not. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. So it's only minimally helpful in trying to create some kind of a framework for understanding what's happening over here at an early time. We have two sites that are very intriguing, rather sexy sites. Okay? There are some problems with them. The Fen Cache is a very well-known cache site. So it's a stash of Clovis points. And I just told you that Clovis is the first universally accepted early culture in North America, taking us back over 11,000 years. Those sites are extremely rare. But here we have loads of full-blown projectile points that look like this, together with a bunch of other big artifacts stashed away. But here's the rub. We don't know exactly where they came from. They were found by private people. 
We know from their records that it was somewhere where in the vicinity of the Wyoming, Idaho, Utah intersection. So I've popped it over there on the map, but we don't know exactly where they came from. So the kind of inferences that we can draw are rather limited. Archaeologists are going to look at the context of the dirt itself, as President Albrecht pointed out, the old dirt. We don't have that evidence. All we have are the artifacts out of context, but they are delicious, delicious artifacts. And it tells us something about what to expect in our project area. I also want to mention a site called Franklin Cave, otherwise known as Little Mountain Cave. Those of you from the Cache Valley will recognize this. If you've ever driven north on our state highway, you will have seen this site right here because it's very prominent. This is not a site that's been professionally excavated, but it's a shame that it wasn't. I think of it as the one that got away in a lot of ways. The site had 12 feet of deposits, all with cultural occupation, starting, we know, at the very earliest end of the spectrum, okay? Taking us back clearly to Clovis time, maybe a little before that. We know that because we've worked with people in the area who have collections that have come from this private uh, land site. And they have been generous, and if you're interested after the talk, I actually have casts of some of the very early artifacts from this cave. This cave also had lots of perishable remains, which is rare. We have loads of bone from all the levels. We have fibers and we have other artifacts that we normally don't have preserved. So had it been professionally excavated, this one could have given us a foundation to work in that's right in the middle of our project area, but that never did happen. The people of Cache Valley tried. They tried to interest Jesse Jennings from the University of Utah, an archeologist, very well known, who was working at Danger Cave at the time down in Tooele County which went on to become one of the seminal sites in Paleo-Indian prehistory in all of North America, but he wouldn't bite. He didn't ultimately excavate this, so it's the one that got away. So, we don't have much to work with. How do we move forward and why move forward in an area where we know nothing? Well, I'm going to tell you why I found this area so intriguing. And there are really four environmental assets, I've called them, ecological features, that each one of which would give me reason to want to go here. In combination, they make this a truly unique place in the context of all of North America. Okay? And let me explain what I mean by that. You're going to see now that I'm focusing on southeastern Idaho, because we're going to segue into the work that we've done on the ground. But what I say environmentally clearly goes for northern Utah as well. It doesn't end at that geopolitical border. Number one, this is a very well watered landscape in the context of the, the very arid west. We have lots of, of, of water of all forms, including big permanent lakes like Bear Lake, there's our lovely Bear Lake Vista, and Gray's Lake. We have permanent streams and rivers like the Portneuf and the Bear and the Blackfoot, tributaries thereof. And because much of this is in the Yellowstone hotspot, we also have springs, springs, springs. We have hot springs. That's the real reason I want to work here. I want to be able to take a dip in the hot springs. I'm getting older, and it makes me feel better after a day of excavating. We also have lots of cold springs, mineral springs. I bet some of you have bottled water from Hooper Spring, which is sparkling water, naturally sparkling water by Soda Springs. That's why it gets its name. So all kinds of water on this landscape. That's special feature number one. And that's, if you're a hunter-gatherer, extremely important, right? That's going to set parameters on how you move about the landscape, because you got to have it. But that's not all. Number two in our region, we have ubiquitous sources of stone of various kinds for the tools that you need if you're living 10 or 11,000 years ago. We have all of these yellow stars representing obsidian sources. You all know that obsidian is volcanic glass. It's extremely sharp, so sharp that it's been used in eye surgery because the wound will heal so much faster than if you use a steel scalpel. It's that sharp. If you've ever touched it, you probably cut yourself. We also have, however, materials that are much more durable, extensively distributed in the project area, cherts and quartzite. So if you're going to make a scraper, if you're trying to process a mammoth hide or a bison hide, you need some tough tools too. Those are available in mountainous areas in outcrops, and we have mountains throughout our project area. So those are available, and all that water is constantly reworking all that stuff into cobbles and depositing them across the landscape. So it would be difficult to go anywhere in the project area and not have ready access to whatever stone you might want. 
If you've driven across this project area, and I bet everyone has, you've noticed the basalt flows. Those are rather young flows, older than people, younger than dinosaurs, just to put it in perspective of our trailer. These provide natural shelter in many cases. Sometimes lava tubes, for example, collapse. Franklin Cave's a great example of a shelter in the Cache Valley area, and we know they get used extensively. Jesse Jennings made a career out of Danger Cave, south of our project area. We talked about the one that got away. There are lots of other features like this on that landscape that people would have used. And this is the coolest feature of all, in my mind. I'm still kind of agape a about these because they were new to me. They don't have these in Colorado, and they're rare anywhere else actually in the world. And these are ice caves. Some of you have visited them, I'm sure, in northern Utah and southeastern Idaho. They're places where ice is available year-round. It's permanent. So from the point of view of a hunter-gatherer, that's really what that boils down to is you have a refrigerator. That's crazy. Hunter-gatherers don't have refrigerators, but ours do. So you can store food and solve other logistical problems that you have in a way that other people, other places, just can't. Poor people who aren't living in this area. I feel so bad for them. And then finally, and most importantly, I've already given you three good reasons why this place is so special. Here's the other one. Right here, this little colorful blop that I've placed on a map of Idaho covers our southeastern portion of the state, and nor nor northern Utah as well. Those four colors represent four different environmental zones. I call this area that we're focusing on the mother of all ecotones. An ecotone is a place where two different environments come together, and prehistoric people love them because you get unique suites of resources that represent those different areas that are meeting. In addition, you get easy access to all of those other places that have very differently structured landscapes and differently structured resource bases. So if you're a Paleo-Indian person living in this area, you have access to the Central Rockies. They're right there in the project area. The Tetons were just up to our northeast and might have to get encircled, because I really like the Tetons. They might have to get sucked into the project area. You have access to the Wyoming Basin, just over to the east of Bear Lake. That's basically an extension of the plains. It would have supported big bison herds that we associate with plains adaptations. And you've got ready access to, those, to that environment. The Great Basin, of course, to the south has its own array of resources. And to the northwest, we have the Columbia Plateau. The Snake River Plain bounds our project area. The snake drains to the Columbia, drains to the Pacific Ocean. So all of these things come together right there at ground zero that's our focal area. So water, stone, shelter, refrigerators, and an environment that's second to none. All of that tells me this is the place to look. And if you want evidence of the very earliest people, Look here, they're gonna figure this out really quickly and they have ready access from the places they would have come from when they first came to the Americas via that Snake River Plain. So, what do you do? We've got a spot that is enticing. Come to me, come study my archeology, span it says. How do you do it though without that foundation to build upon? Well, there are a lot of people out there who know exactly what the archeology span looks like and I believe it's a good idea to talk to them. I'm talking about farmers and ranchers and hunters, and I met a fisherman this morning from the Logan area, and a variety of other people who spend their time out on the landscape sometimes have done so for generations. They find material in their fields while they're plowing. They sit and they look as they plow at travel routes for people. Many of them are passionate about the environment and are out there exploring and, and thinking about hypotheses for what ancient people did, because there's a passion for this that's you all understand because you're here at 7.30 in the morning. So we tap that resource base by reaching out to people who we knew were very into archaeology. And we also tried to pull in new collaborators by hosting a series of what we called prehistoric roadshows. We modeled these after the TV show Antiques Roadshow, invited people to bring artifacts they may have collected from their land to us. And they came in droves. I was amazed. I didn't know if it would work at all. I worried. I thought I'll be sitting there by myself, my archaeology colleagues, and me will just be sitting there. But in fact, people came in their pickup trucks with dollies and backpacks and buckets and boxes. Honestly, I'm not kidding. There were hundreds of them. And they packed our, our library in Soda Springs, where we held one of these. And they packed the Museum of Anthropology. And they brought 
they're treasures. Now, here I am looking at some treasure. Which part of this picture is the treasure? It's not that. It's none of this. It's not that. It's not that. It's that right there. It's not the Ark, Indiana Jones. It's the notebook that contains the information about where all those artifacts came from. And many of these people keep detailed notes and detailed maps, sometimes better than archaeologists I know, of these finds. That's what we need to be able to move forward and to be able to start documenting those sites. So we followed up. In summer 2008, a team of USU students, and you see two of them right here, Ben, and Ashley, we went out and we located those sites most of the time with the people who had found them so that we could get it exactly right. We didn't want to make a mistake. This is important as we build this foundation. Uh, and we documented those sites in great detail. And here's what happened. Over the course of that one summer with a small team, we documented 57 sites that are older than 8,000 years. That's almost five dozen sites. We had none to start with, except those two tantalizing little teasers that we don't know much about and couldn't really pin down. Now we've got 57. That's amazing to me that we would have that kind of a density after one season of work. Let me tell you a little bit about those sites. One of the things that's great about our database is that we have nice representation of different kinds of sites. We have a likely kill site over here on the east side of Gray's Lake where we have mammoth bone and mammoth tusk and mammoth teeth associated with human artifacts. Awesome. We also have campsites shown in blue, the blue dots. Those are, are sites that have high diversities of artifacts. We like campsites as archaeologists because camps are places where people are living. Where you live, you do lots of different things. You're not just killing a mammoth. That's pretty cool. But you're doing all kinds of things in your home setting. So that's going to teach us more inherently about people than a special use site will. So we like those. We have some, some rock shelters and caves. You see three pink dots. Those are always promising. And then the green dots represent just a generic term called a lithic scatter, where we have just flakes of stone on the landscape, but obviously some chronologically diagnostic artifacts to have pushed these into the, to the uh, database. Now. In terms of time frame represented in these 57 sites, we have excellent representation both of the early part of the Paleo-Indian era and the later portion of the Paleo-Indian era. Eight of the sites shown in the pink here, and here's a couple of the examples of those, those artifacts that have come off of these sites, date to this very early time frame. So they're contemporaneous with Clovis, or they are Clovis, or there's a strong, strong hint in the case of some of the technologies that they're Clovis, or their artifacts found with mammoths. That gets them into this database. And that's a high density of sites that old for a landscape the size of this one. It gets even more interesting, in my view, as you move to the later part of the Paleo-Indian era from about 10,000 to about 8,000 years ago. Now. OK, think back. We had those four environments coming together. They have different ecological structures. They also all have well-documented archaeological records. Those are places people have focused for 100 years. The mountains are the place that's been slighted. So we know what our artifacts look like all the way through that record, and they look different in those four regions. All those regions come together. So going into this, one wonders, are we going to see one of those records dominating our project area, or are we going to see some funny mix of those, the records of those four regions? And the answer is we see all four basically equally represented, which I think is really neat. So for example, 15 of the sites yielded these kinds of artifacts that are the consummate representation of Great Basin Paleo-Indian occupation. Okay? And those blue dots that you see represent those 15 sites. Notice as I flip through the next three slides that'll show the distributions of each of those different geographic regions and records, that the distribution itself isn't going to change much. It's not like the plain sites are closer to the plains, the Great Basin sites are closer to the Great Basin. They're all in about the same places. So again, same time frame, really different looking artifacts. Okay? If you had handed me these out of context and said, Bonnie, where did these come from? I would have said, you had to have been in Wyoming or maybe Kansas or something like that. They are just absolute dead ringers for Plains Paleo-Indian archaeology of the time. They're a bison hunting adaptation. That gives us hints about one of the resources that was probably important to our southeast Idahoans and northern Utahns. 
Here's a mountain tradition represented with 16 sites. So again, 15, 15, now we're at 16. So the representation of each region is about equal. Each of these dots shows one of these sites. And these are an old friend for me. I defined this projectile point type in the Southern Rockies back when people said there wasn't an occupation. These things are all over the place in the Southern Rockies, and, and voila, here they are in the Central Rockies too. And then finally, lest we forget our Northwestern tradition, we have 17 sites with artifacts that look a lot like this that tell us that there's a Northwestern influence. So from this, we can say that the Paleo-Indian record is really robust and really, really diverse. We can see that all site types are represented in these surface sites. We have the whole Paleo-Indian sequence represented, excellent representation on the early end, and very interesting representation on the late end because we have all those four different regions represented equally. Archaeologically, if I have to sum up, this region is just as amazing as we would have predicted it was and did predict it was based on its ecology alone. So now what do we do? What about the next 15 or 30 years? First, we need to increase that site database. Most immediately, summer 2010, we're going to send out another army of student teams and we're going to put dots on the map and cache in rich counties in Utah. And it's going to look a lot like that southeastern Idaho map when we get finished. That's important because the more dots we have on the map, the better we can detect patterning on the landscape and the better we will become at predicting where other sites will be in the absence of a lead from somewhere else, someone else. So for example, we will be able to detect particular terraces of our major rivers that are terraces that have the right age dirt, the old dirt. Okay? Some terraces are too young, some terraces are way too old, some terraces are just right. It's a Goldilocks principle. And so if we're going to go out and do survey and look for new sites, I don't want to send out an army and just start stomping across all those counties. I want to target my work and make, get a lot of bang for my buck as I'm out there and go to the places that are going to have sites that are the right age. So that's why it's important to continue to bolster that database of surface sites. But we need to couple with that an effort to identify those sites that have buried occupations, buried evidence of camping or killing or whatever it is that people were doing. So in this slide, we're using a, one of our tools of the trade, a core. This is an automatic core. It takes about a two-inch core, so it doesn't do a lot of damage to the landscape. And it shows us, we lay it out on the ground, and it shows us soil formation and other clues about the age of the dirt. Oftentimes, we can tell right by looking at it if we've got sediments that are just way too old. It's out of the ballpark because of characteristics of the dirt itself or if it's too young. So this is one way to tell is there potential for buried archaeology here. And this is extremely important because the data we get from buried sites when we test them and then ultimately excavate them is at a whole different level of resolution than the surface sites. They're crucial, but it's from the buried sites, for example, that we find fire hearts. Fire hearts have charcoal that we can radiocarbon date so we can obtain absolute dates on the ages of these sites. They contain evidence of what people have been processing and eating in the form of burned seeds, burned plant materials, burned bones. They contain evidence, because they've been protected by dirt through time, thank you, Mother Nature, of human use of space. We can make inferences about how people were actually using a campsite. Sometimes we can make inferences about possible gender differentiation in who's doing what tasks. So that's a, resolution, or a level of resolution that we can never have with surface sites. And we need both as part of a research program that's really going to get us to some cool answers. So who cares? It's way cool. There's no doubt about that. It's way cool if I do say so myself. And I hope you agree with that. But I submit to you that there are at least three entities out there who care a lot about what archaeologists do. Number one, companies that have work to do out on the landscape and frankly right now an economy that they need to be stimulating and are, which we appreciate. Number two, students who want a fun and recession-proof career. And those two go together, and I'll explain that in a moment. And then finally, and this is what I've been talking about all along, community members like yourself who want a piece of the thrill. It is really fun. We all love Indiana Jones. There's a reason those movies succeed at the box office. So in terms of the first of these, there's an enormous private sector of archaeology. This is a little known fact to people like, oh, say my mom, who when I told her I was going to be an archaeologist, 
it's fortunate she's still with us because I thought she would have a heart attack. And in fact, I think it's only when I got tenure, thank you, Stan Albrecht, that she finally relaxed like two years ago. So this poor woman lived on pins and needles for years and years and years thinking she is going to crash and burn. You can't make it as an archaeologist. Not so, Mom. This is a monstrous field. There are dozens of firms in Utah alone. There are hundreds of firms across the country that are private archaeological firms. And these firms exist because legislation says that if public land of any kind, federal, state, and generally there are county and city laws that mirror these federal laws, are going to impact public resources, or if private land will be impacted with public monies, archaeology will be done. We will go out and we will identify the resources that will be impacted by the work, and we will mitigate damage that might occur. And that might mean we excavate the site before we put a power line through it. It might mean we reroute a power line. We have lots of ways that we can work to protect the archaeology while still facilitating the work that needs to be done. It's recession proof because we have a habit as a society of poking around in the ground, whether we're oil dependent at the moment and we're focusing our energy on exploring new sources of oil, or we go undergo a paradigm shift and we're focusing on alternative energy sources like geothermal or solar, Either way, we're impacting the landscape. Either way, legislation says archaeology must be done, which is why they're such a monstrous sector. So, and that's why it's recession proof. It doesn't matter where we're at, we're going to have work to do. And so I've watched my friends in that field of archaeology sustain the, the uh, recession that we're in right now much better than most other sectors for that very reason. We decided we needed a piece of that pie because contrary to belief, Archaeologists are not haters of money. We don't. We don't hate it. We don't mind it a bit. In fact, we want a piece of this pie. So we decided that it would be a good idea to create our own private firm, and it's called USU Archaeological Services. And Ned Weinschenker is sitting out there, and I want to thank Ned for his help. He's the VP for Strategic Ventures and Economic Development. I can't look away and get that right, so I have to read it off the screen. And also, we have representative of our Technology Commercialization Office in the audience, and they were instrumental in allowing us to do that. So that's me tipping my hat to you guys. So this business is the first spin-off business for the College of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences at Utah State University. The idea is it's a private business. We can employ our students during the busy time in the summer and give them valuable experience, allow them to make money so they can pay their tuition. We also provide quality services for business people who are out there stimulating the economy. So business people, if you need archaeology done, we're your people. Let me know. And the profits, we've written the bylaws such that royalties go right back to the anthropology program to create fellowships and scholarships for our students. So we see this as a really cool feedback loop. Here's some of our students. This is Shannon and this is Barbara, who are learning in the field the skills they need to succeed in the private sector. And both of these ladies intend to pursue that as a career. And here's what's cool. This is this last summer, 2009. We're working on a site on private land north of Preston. It's a site that was one of these 57 in our database from 2008 that had potential for buried deposits. So we're testing it now to see, is there really some archaeology down there? Guess what? Bonus, there is. And it's old. We have a fire hearth that had a burnt stemmed point in it. That's what you want. That's fantastic evidence. It's an artifact that's the right age based on its style, and it's been burnt. It's associated with culturally burned material. That's exactly what we're looking for. The interesting thing about this particular site is it's right at ground zero for a power line that's going to be going through this, this land. So one of the things we can do as archaeologists is serve as mediators between the landowner on the one hand, who's very excited by the archaeology, and the, the company on the other hand, and figure out solutions to either reroute or to conduct the archaeology and figure out what's here before we put that power line through. So we treasure that role. Finally, you guys. We want to engage the community. We held the road shows, yes, because we wanted to learn about what people knew out there. And that clearly worked, and it will continue to work. But we feel like we have an obligation to provide something in return. People are helping us. We've got hundreds of eyes out there now that are part of our research team. But we thought it would be really cool to write something for them that's not a nasty, awful, jargon-filled journal article that no one wants to slog through. And that's the newsletter that you all have at your place. 
we created these and we tried every, every way we could not to include any jargon. We wrote it accessibly, we put lots of pictures in there, and we basically just explained the results of our 2008 research. We printed a thousand of these and we placed them in libraries all across the project area and we, su we submitted press releases to all the local papers that said, if you want one of these, go to the library and pick one up or else call me and I'll send you one. They're all gone now. All, you guys got the last of the thousand. I saved them out for you when I knew I was going to be giving this talk. So that has been a phenomenal success. I've had dozens and dozens of phone calls from people saying, wow, this is so neat that you did this. And if you notice, there's a little oops, wanted poster inside that shows the kind of artifacts that are the sites that are representative of the, of the sites that we're after. So at the same time, we hope we can get a few more clues about other sites out there. And then finally, the way that we try to engage the community is through our USU Museum of Anthropology, which is really a voice for this really vibrant, exciting field of ours. Currently, our museum is located on the second floor of Old Main in a beautiful space, but we don't have a lot of room. So when donors come to me and say, oh, I've got a fantastic ethnographic collection or artifact collection I'd like to give you, I have to say, sorry, I don't have space to store that. And I can't tap into curation. We have a curation crisis in our state and in our nation. When the, all those private firms are out there doing work, they're generating a lot of artifacts that they take home with them. That's part of the legislation. A box about this size costs on the order of $500 to store. I kind of want a piece of that pie, too. So I suggested to our, our college leaders and our central leaders and to Stan Albrecht himself, who is very kind, in recognizing that this is a way, if we can expand our space to make some more money and to increase our presence and our outreach efforts. So we're looking towards a new museum of anthropology that refurbishes the barn, which some of you are probably familiar with. It's a beautiful, iconic structure on the Utah State campus. We think it's perfect for a museum of anthropology and a little welcome center to boot for the campus. And we'll add on some space. We'll have over 11,000 square feet when all is said and done. And we'll be able to take those collections that people want to give us and generate funds through curation. So I hope you believe me. We don't hate money. We like money. We're practical people. Sometimes we try to be. Uh, and that's really where I want to stop. But I have one last slide. I'm not going to talk during the slide. And when I'm done, I'll be glad to answer questions that you might have. But there are real heroes in archaeology. And this slide is going to pay tribute to the real heroes in archaeology. But they're not the fedora-wearing, whip-wielding, gun-slinging, machete-swinging version that you guys may be familiar with. They're these people. <laughs> And that, my friends, is archaeology. <laughs> All right, so what have you always wanted to know about archaeology that I can give you the real skinny on? Got to be something. Yes, sir. In one of your early slides, you showed yourself on top of a mountain <laughs> in your study area, I presume. That was in Colorado, where I've worked. That was where my previous work was. Um, it was in the Gunnison, Colorado area. You want to know what I was doing up there? There was actually a reason for being up there besides fun. I do tend to hike up there for fun, too. But I, I have an ancillary project where I'm collecting quartzite, one of those durable materials, so that I can develop methods to source it, to create a fingerprint for it. Because if I can do that so that I can identify the fingerprint of an outcrop here and an outcrop over here and an outcrop over here, because they're all different and we have equipment that can do this, if I find a tool then and I an analyze it for trace elements, I can match it to which formation it came from and I can make some really cool inferences about where people have been moving on the landscape. It's like track, sort of like, I don't know, connecting the dots basically. So that's what I was doing. There was quartzite up there at 13,000 feet. I was standing on a big block of it and I was about to sample it.
<laughs> yeah, that's true. They're a little low, but there are the Tetons. I could just, you know, just extend that boundary. They're pretty spectacular. We'll let the latitude make up for the lack of elevation. Yes, ma'am. How did you define your area of study? For example, the Paga site was not in there, and then you talked about wanting to put in the Tetons. Why did you define it as you did? I defined it as I did for those four reasons that I described. Because the Hogup Cave is in the Great Basin proper. That's one of the four regions that I get to work with. So I'm in ground zero where those environments come together, where we get unique suites of resources, and where my people can access all. And historically, we know that prehistoric people of all stripes, of all ages, focus on ecotones. They love them because they are so rich, and they, they create those unique suites of resources. So that's the specific reason. And it has a lot of mountains, too. And at a, at a human level and a spiritual level, that's really important to me. Yes, sir. Uh, our university has a strong landscape architectural program. Uh, how much crossover is there between your group and that group? We've not had a lot of crossover with landscape architecture specifically. We, you know, archaeology and anthropology are inherently a very interdisciplinary subdiscipline, discipline. So we do work across the college. We work extensively with geology. We work extensively with geography. We work with biology. We work with sociologists if we're cultural anthropologists. Landscape architecture, we haven't had that kind of crossover. There just hasn't been a reason for it. But um, yeah, it's maybe something to explore. Um, I don't have no. <laughs> I don't have any stories. Did you want an interpretive dance with that? <laughs> so a day in the life. All right, so these are highly mobile people. These are people that are moving around the landscape. They're not settled. However, what I would maintain to you is that in our area, they're actually probably moving less often than folks in a lot of other places because they have those water resources in particular. Lakes, big lakes, will tend to serve as anchor points for hunter-gatherers. They're places where you can stay for a much longer period of time because you won't exhaust your resource base as quickly because the resources will replenish themselves. They'll come to you. The fish, will, for example, you can keep fishing a lot longer than if you're in the Great Basin and you're hunting out an area and then forcing yourself to have to move because you've denuded the area around you. So I would say in our project area, you've got folks who are, yes, they're mobile, but they're probably hanging out for maybe on the order of weeks. In some sites, we need a place for people to winter. So some of those cave sites like Franklin Cave that we looked at would be good spots potentially for winter occupations because they're very sheltered. We know the occupation is sustained. People are not going to be moving around as much in the winter if they don't have to be. So it kind of depends what season we might be talking about. We don't, again, because you've got stone nearby, water nearby, um, ice nearby for storing food, even if it's July, I don't anticipate seeing the sort of pattern we, we see out on the plains, which are much better known. That's where we, we tend to take the Paleo-Indian understanding we have from the plains, because that's historically where everybody worked, and superimpose it everywhere else. But out there, you have only a very few species of, of animals and plants that people can use. So people on the plains throughout time have always been megafauna hunters, bison primarily, a little earlier than that, mammoths. And what that means is that if you're a hunter-gatherer, you're at their mercy. You're tethered to them. You're going to go where the herds go. That's going to dictate your mobility. In our area, people are going to be making choices because they have all those different resources. So there's a level when you have a resource base as varied at this, as varied as this one, that you can sort of determine your destiny and what you want to do in a given day in a way that you can't in other places. So that's not exactly a day in the life, but I hope it gives you a sense of how the folks in our area are liable to have used that landscape a lot differently than we sort of understand Paleo-Indians to do. They weren't just galloping across hundreds of miles, following after mammoths, following after bison, which is often the picture that's still painted in museums. Not so in our, in our study area, and I think that's something we'll be able to demonstrate over time. You know, that would be the kind of data you're only going to ever get to with excavated assemblages. If you are really lucky and you have enough of those and you can start to see patterning 
on the, uh, uh, at the sites themselves, at the site level, you might get into, be able to identify how many people are present, for example, at a given site, and you'll certainly get a better sense for how long they're there from excavated data. And you might be able to make inferences about, I mentioned this, gender roles of people. It gets tricky, because you don't want to take your own understanding of people and what they do and what gender roles are and impose it on the past. You need to let the data speak. It's tricky, though. Those the, Getting, especially when, when we're dealing with sites that are so old, so rare, and are so subtle, they're not pyramids <laughs> like in our movie clip. That kind, of, that kind of question can be really tricky, but it drives us because we all want that human connection. And the moments when you do get it, when you feel like, I'm sitting here and I see around me this scatter of flakes and I can almost see a butt print where somebody was sitting and flint napping. That's, all, that's an amazing feeling of connection with another human being. So those are the moments that I live for. And you know, so it, it's very hard. It's going to take a long time. So what? You know, we, we're going to start a neat research program here. There are lots of, of talented students out there that can carry on. And eventually, you can start to make those kind of inferences. But it's going to take those excavated sites to do it. Why don't we uh, kick me out? Keep Dr. Pimpleto here for a little bit. She's got some show and tell that oh, she's brought. And she'll be around to answer some questions for any of you who want to talk to her afterwards for a few minutes. But let's wrap up. I'd like to give a special thanks to Kevin Bischoff and our friends from Regis Blue Cross Blue Shield for sponsoring these events. Thank you very much. Your help in sponsoring these has really allowed us, I think, to open up a lot of really interesting dimensions of research. And today we've seen a, a, a different one, a different angle than we've seen before. On your, uh, at your places is a uh, postcard with a reminder of our next event, which will be in January. Uh, Dr. Ken White, who was instrumental in the cloning of Dolly the Sheep, is going to be speaking. Our breakfast is going to feature lamb chops, and we're going to... <laughs> Thanks again to Dr.